Well, good morning. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor here at Walden Community Church. And we've been going through the book of Philippians, examining living a life that matters. Today, we're going to be reading from Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 17 through 20. It says, Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is their shame. With minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So here in this little passage, Paul is showing us two different types of people. The first group of people are the people he calls the enemies of Christ. And he says that their vision is destruction. And the thing that they worship is consumerism and making their name and their reputation more famous. And he says these people are focused here on the earth and they're looking down. And then he says, but you and I, we belong to a different group. Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven. Now, remember, Paul is speaking to a house church led by a woman named Lydia from Philippi, and everyone who lives in Philippi is a citizen of Rome, and they all receive the benefits of being Roman citizens. But Paul is offering them encouragement. See, because the last time Paul and Silas were in Philippi, they were arrested for preaching the gospel. God sent an earthquake to release Paul and Silas from jail. And that was just enough encouragement for this little church that they too could go out there and preach. So Paul offers yet even more encouragement. And he says, be bold. Don't be afraid of the Romans because your citizenship is actually in heaven. That's why we can let all of these earthly woes roll off our backs. That's why we can shrug off anything that's happening in the political world, because you and I are citizens of heaven first. He says in verse 21, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Thank goodness, right? Because my lowly body It is something that I think about a lot. My lowly body is broken and worn out and I can't wait for a new one. And Paul says, when Christ returns, we will be like Jesus. And he says, knowing that, knowing that piece of information, as he heads into chapter four, he says, therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Paul says, I love you guys, and you were made for something better. Don't live for this time down here on earth. He says, I know it's tough, but hang on. I know you're tired, but hold on. Don't quit. Don't give up. There, there's, there is going to be a day <laughs> when it's all going to be worth it, he says. So we have to stay focused as a church. Stay focused on our vision and our reason for being. Paul says when Christ returns, we get a new body. But, you know, we don't have to wait until then in order for us to look like Jesus, especially to look like Jesus to someone else. Because when do I look the most like Christ? Jesus came to save. You and I, we're Christians. We're supposed to be that earthly, visible representation of Jesus, so we look like Jesus when we help save. Last week we talked about being a light to those who live in a dark world, because, you know, we don't want to play church while we're here. We want to belong to something bigger than ourselves. We want to live a life that matters. Jesus came down, he saved us, and when we help save others, then we too can look like Jesus. Paul says we're citizens of heaven. And yet, the Philippian church was deep, deep, deep in Roman territory. How can they be citizens of one kingdom and the other as an ambassador? Do you know what an ambassador is? 
An ambassador is a messenger, it's a herald, it's someone that's sent by their nation to deliver a message or to communicate a thought or to administer a treaty. Aren't Christians messengers of the heavenly kingdom? When Jesus sends his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, he says, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The ambassador of Christ is sent out and instructed to tell other people about the kingdom. We represent the light and the life of Jesus and the truth that he is the king. We champion his cause. We bring forth his agenda because we want all people to know the life-changing, soul-changing relationship that's only possible with him. Romans 12 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Hebrews 13 says here, we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. This world is not our home. When we gave our lives to Christ, we became citizens of heaven. And there are people today who are still lost, still in darkness, and they still need Jesus. So our goal is to introduce them. We want everyone to know who Jesus is and to fall in love with him and to discover all of that hope and all of that joy and the vision that he has for their life. And so if people are gonna see Christ and find Christ for themselves, if they're gonna discover Jesus, then, then they first have to find him. But why do, why do they need us then? Why, why does Jesus need an ambassador? Why can't people just see Jesus for themselves? Well, because people today are spiritually blind. Second Corinthians says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Their eyes have been blinded by darkness. Their vision is clouded and polluted by all the desires of this world. How are they ever going to see Jesus? No, if they're ever going to see Jesus, they have to see the Jesus that's in us. The challenge is before us. We must look like Jesus. In Ephesians 5, Paul challenges the people of the early church. He says, be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This says, be imitators of God. Can that even be done? I mean, Paul says, I'll get a new body when Jesus comes again. Can't, can't I just wait until then? Is it even possible to look like Jesus now here on earth? I think so. Because being a follower of Jesus is not about believing in Jesus. It's about the life of Jesus invading your life and transforming your life, changing your thoughts and your words and your actions to be more like him. And in that, we grow up. We need to grow up. We need to grow more like Christ. How do we do that? Well, before you can go anywhere, you first need to realize where you are. As a church, we are supposed to be a community of humble, serving people. But most of us come to church to see what we can get. First, we look for a church maybe that has good preaching or good music or a good children's program. We might say, oh, we're looking for a, a church that has a really strong heart for missions. Those are all good things, certainly. Those are great things. But because we live in a consumer-based world, sadly, we have fallen in love with this idea that the church is about us or that church becomes a place where we are ministered to or where our needs are met. But if we're to be people who live lives that matter, 
then our focus needs to move away from ourselves and towards other people. Sure, I know we all love the comfort and the familiarity of our friends, but the church, any church, will never grow, never mature, never accomplish its vision until we adopt a heart and a mind like Jesus and begin to serve. And the first step is to grow in wisdom. Luke 2 says, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Even just like we said last week, we are called to be children of God. Paul even calls us that. Jesus calls us sheep. But our attitude should not be resigned to stay a child. Because what are the characteristics of a child? A child is only concerned about their needs. My youngest son, Dermot, is in first grade. Can you imagine never getting out of the first grade? Can you imagine being 53 years old and having to sit at a desk? A desk that doesn't even fit you? <laughs> you have the same stories, you gotta do the same projects and finger paint and work on your ABCs and your reading and cutting construction paper into shapes. That'll get boring. Same old, same old every year. You know why some people leave church? It's boring. Do you know why it's boring? Not because the church doesn't change, it's because they don't change. They leave one church and they go to another, only discover, huh, that church talks about serving and giving too. You think? We need to grow as believers. Do you want to be like Jesus? Jesus increased in wisdom and in favor with God and others. The author of Hebrews writes, about this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have the powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Most of us in the church have been living off milk, and many of us never grow out of it. Milk is only the basics. It's the beginning. It's the early stages. The author of Hebrews says, by now, most of you should be teachers, but instead, you're still bottle-fed. You know, I walk a fine line as a preacher, because on the one hand, I understand that there are people in this room who've gone to church their entire lives, and they've heard every single story, and they come in here and they want to learn something new. There are also people out there who, just like my wife, have a seminary degree of their own, and they're secretly critiquing me. But there are also people that are brand new to church, who've only been a Christian a few years, and they have not heard every story. So how do you preach for every single person in the room? You can't. The truth is, the message that's taught from here needs to be aimed at our guest, aimed at the new believers, aimed at the people who still need the basics. So that means the rest of you who are already prepared to move on to solid food, you now begin to seek a deeper level of commitment. You now seek closer relationships with one another and start to develop habits that'll make you more and more like Jesus. What, what's one really easy thing that you could probably start doing on your own right now? Read your Bible, right? Read your Bible. Read your Bible on your own. You know, almost nine out of 10 households, that's 87% of Americans own a Bible. According to the American Bible Society, the average American household has three. Yeah, but who's reading them? LifeWay Research surveyed Americans and found that only one in five Americans have read through the entire Bible once. I thought one in five, that's pretty good. But that includes 11% who've read the entire Bible just once, and 9% who've read through it multiple times. Another 12% say they've almost read 
the entire Bible, and 15% of people say they've read at least half. 52% of Americans have very little knowledge of the Bible, and one in 10 has never read any of it, while 13%, maybe a few sentences, 30% say they've read a couple of passages. What about Christians? Studies say that only 18% of Christians read their Bible during the week on their own. 18%. That means the only Bible they ever get is this, what they get in worship. And usually, they're waiting for the preacher to read it to them. Friends, I would challenge you to take the time to discover all of the deep truths of the Bible and to hear the voice of God speaking to you through the scriptures so that the word of God becomes the living word of God. Solid food is for the mature. Solid food is your discernment of the voice of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Jesus says in John 16. There is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you about your future. Wow, your future? That means as long as I remain a child in the faith, I'm just reading about and learning about all the things Jesus did 2,000 years ago. But if I'm hearing the voice of God and it's becoming the living word in me, that I'm not just going to read the stories of the past, I'm actually going to start reading about the revelations that the Spirit has for my life today. The Bible is not becoming the living word for me, and until it does, I'm never going to hear God's will for my future. John 16 goes on to say, He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. Jesus says that everything that belongs to God, everything that God has, Jesus is willing to reveal to you. But it's all dependent on your ability, through discipline, to discern and hear the Holy Spirit through his word. And that's going to take spiritual maturity. We need to grow in wisdom. And we need to grow in in our relationships. You and I, we are created for relationships. We experience life through relationships. And God also exists in community. So he expects us to exist in community. That means, again, if we want to grow and be more like Christ, then we can't cut and run after every single service. We need to stick around for a fellowship. We need to plug in to a class or a ministry or a leadership team or teach a class. Yes, we're called to love God, but Jesus also commands us, commands us to love others. Do you know what is so important at church? The people. The people are what it's really about. Not me, not Mike, not the choir, not donuts, the people. We lost a lot of great people this last year. And they all felt comfortable enough to leave or walk away because they weren't plugged in. Maybe. But ultimately, it was because we weren't plugged into them. I can't be the only one who misses them. It's just like life. Life isn't about boats or cars or guns or clothes. It's about people. And when we die, we will not, nobody's going to miss our stuff. <laughs> They're going to miss us. When other people die, you don't miss their stuff, you miss them. Life is about people. Church is about people. You don't ever want to get to the point after someone is gone and ask yourself, what could I have done any different? So ask yourself today, am I spending enough time with those key relationships? Are they, are they growing or are they stagnant? Am I investing in other people's lives? We are called to be like Jesus. And Jesus grew in stature and in favor with people. Ugh. 
people, but people are what's wrong with the world. I don't, I don't have time for people. I know. It's the same excuse we all have. But if we're called to be like Jesus, Jesus always made time for others. They were not a distraction. They weren't a bother. In fact, he says, he came for them. We have to create more margin in our life. Margins are the blank spaces that you don't write in. You don't allow those parts of the page to fill up. You leave them empty. So as long as you don't fill up those spaces, then you'll always have time for relationships. Relationships will be developed in the margins of our lives. Each of us is responsible for our own schedule. We're all responsible for how we manage our day. So if I don't prioritize my time, then the circumstances of my life will decide my time for me. An easy thing to do would be to plug into a Bible study. Don't wait for the church to do it. You do it. You just grab three other couples and say, let's meet at my house for Bible study and dessert. <laughs> grab five other friends and say, let's meet at my house. Just think, if you grab some friends, they don't even have to be close friends. They can, just be, they can be strangers. If you grab some people and get into a small group and do a Bible study, you're automatically checking off two things. You're growing closer to God and growing closer to others. In fact, if you're going to be around this summer, email the church. Email the church and say, I am willing to have a Bible study at my house. I am even willing to lead it sometimes. And, and you send that to us right now, and, and we'll try to plug you in right now. We all need to grow in wisdom and in relationships. And we need to grow in the same direction. Habakkuk 2.2 says, The Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. Proverbs 29 says, Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. You know, it's been said that if you aim at nothing, you will hit it. We're called to be like Jesus. Did Jesus have a vision? Did Jesus have a plan? Yeah, he did. And he was laser focused. After all, he only had three and a half years to change the world. In Matthew 20, he said, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In Luke 19, he said the Son of Man keep, came to seek and to save the lost. See, as long as you come to the church, the church is going to preach an altogether different message than the world. The world says, life is about you. It's about money. It's about making a living. Life is about your happiness, and it's about your comfort. That's why we now have a society of people who are boohooing every time someone hurts their feelings. They made me unhappy. Yeah, that's going to happen. And it's going to go on happening <laughs> because life is not about you. Life is about doing what God wants. And it's about being people of faith. And as people of faith, we need a vision a vision for the future and where we're going. Why do we need a shared vision? Because vision creates momentum in our life. It pulls us forward. It creates uh, an energy. It says that there's a bigger action that's enabling us to take a risk. And what do you do with that vision? You examine the goal, and then you just ask yourself, how best do we get there? What was Jesus' vision? to seek and to save the lost. So he defines that, and then everything else he does is about hitting that target. Christians, if we're gonna grow in wisdom and grow in relationships, then we need a plan, a bigger plan than just come to church every Sunday, sometimes. If we're gonna live lives that matter, if we're gonna make a change in the world, in our neighborhood, in our families, we need a vision. How do you live a life that matters? Ask yourself, what does God want you to be remembered for at the end of your life? What mark 
does God want you to make on the world? What does God want you to contribute to? What does God want you to be known for? Because you may not have a vision for your life, but God has a vision for your life. And it's up to you to receive it and then to begin working towards it. If our citizenship is in heaven, that means we need to start acting like a card-carrying, flag-waving citizen of that holy place. It also means that our first act of allegiance is to God and his plan because this is his earth and we are his. Paul says there's two kinds of people in the world. Those who live selfishly for themselves and they pursue their own fame and their own glory. And then there are those who live for something higher. Let's all be the latter. Let's pray together. Father God, your son came and he was the ultimate example. He was perfect. The Bible says that he was even without sin. Lord, that's the goal. The goal is to be like Jesus, to be like your son each and every day. That means that I don't just believe in him. I don't just believe these words on this page are true, but that I act like him. I talk like him. I think like him. I see the world the way he sees the world. I admit that if he came even into my world now, in this year, in my city, and he preached and taught the same things and did it the same way, that he would get the same results, that there would be hundreds and thousands of people who would need to hear this message, and that they would flock to him, and that they would want this grace. They would want this forgiveness. There is a world outside that is tired of lies, and they are tired of the garbage that the world is slinging, and they need to be saved. They need to be rescued. Your church is still a saving place. It's still a rescuing place. Let those who are in your churches everywhere continue to be tiny versions of Jesus, Christians, people whose hands and feet are citizens of heaven, whose voices are citizens of heaven, whose actions are citizens of heaven, people who long to go home and be in heaven. Your son taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be heaven focused. Amen. Thanks for watching. Thanks for spending some time with us this morning. Of course, as always, if uh, you've enjoyed uh, the lesson today, make sure you can grab that uh, URL, that address up there at the top, and you can post it to your social media wall. Let other people know what you watched this morning, or you can also post it to a friend's wall if you think it might benefit them. I wanna tell you we're open, our church is open. If you come uh, for 9.30 service or 11 o'clock service, it's gonna look exactly like it always did. It's gonna feel like it did. The church is starting to fill back up. People are coming back. Uh, we even got coffee and donuts in between services. We got kids running around. It's starting to look uh, like, it, like it used to, but we still miss you. We miss you, we want you back. Uh, please consider coming back. Drop by the office anytime if you have any questions or concerns, or if you just want to say hi, we would love to see you and talk to you and just love on you. We want to be the church where you live. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.